Tonight, we will tackle the big question that many in the church have about the rapture. And the question is this, is the rapture a different event than what we refer to as the second coming of Jesus? Are they two separate events or are they one single event with Jesus coming back? I believe the rapture is the next big event where Jesus will come specifically, notice how I'm wording this, specifically for his bride, the church, in which he will take her away from this earth, away from this world. I believe the rapture is the literal fulfillment of Jesus' parable of the ten bridesmaids or the ten virgins that I covered in session one. So I think tonight it may be a good time for us to go back to session number one. And uh, I want to read to you that scripture, Matthew 25, verse 1. <clears throat> the kingdom of heaven. So what's Jesus talking about? Heaven, a kingdom. The kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of ten bridesmaids who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Anybody see something? There's bridesmaids, there's a bridegroom, there's a kingdom, and there's heaven. Jesus says this story will illustrate heaven and a kingdom. So five of the bridesmaids were foolish and five were wise. The five who were foolish didn't take enough olive oil for their lamps. But the other five were wise enough to take along extra oil. What might you need extra oil for? What might that symbolize in this story? Wise and foolish. Some are going to be in it for the long haul, however long it takes. Even after delays. Even after times when you thought um, it was time. Extra oil. Verse 5. When the bridegroom was delayed. Why is Jesus telling the story? The bridegroom is delayed. They all, all ten, became drowsy and they all fell asleep. But something happens in verse 6. At midnight, they were aroused. They were roused by something. Something happened. He calls it a shout. And what is that shout that wakes everybody up? Someone shouts, look, the bridegroom is coming. Come out to meet him. And all the bridesmaids, all ten, got up and prepared their lamps. Then the five foolish ones asked the others, Please give us some of your oil because our lamps are going out. But the others, the wise bridesmaids, they replied, We don't have enough oil for all of us. You go and shop Go to the shop and buy some for yourselves. But while they were gone to buy oil, they departed from the announcement, the bridegroom's coming, come out and meet him. The announcement was clear. All ten heard the announcement. Someone made an announcement, it's time. But they weren't ready. They weren't prepared But while they were gone to buy oil, the bridegroom came. Then those who were ready, notice the word ready. Those who were ready, they're wise because they were preparing, even if delayed, even if it wasn't when you expected it, they were still prepared. When those who were ready went in with him to what? A marriage feast. Anybody see this? There's a wedding. There's a bridegroom. There's a bride. There's a marriage feast. Then those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and something happens. It sends cold chills down my spine. They went into the marriage feast, five of them. The other five, they're out trying to figure out how to get ready now. And the door was closed, and the door was locked. Verse 11, later the other five bridesmaids returned, and they stood outside calling, Lord, Lord. Open the door for us. But he called back, believe me, I don't know you. So you too. Here's Jesus' uh, warning at the end of this parable. So you too must keep watch. For you do not know the day 
or the hour of my return. The shout. Everything inside this story has, a, there's a shout that turns the entire story from sleepiness to drowsiness. They were all sleepy. They had all uh, become drowsy, all 10. But the shout went out at midnight while everyone was sleepy, while everyone was drowsy. The Apostle Paul says there's going to be a shout when the dead and the alive, those who are in, buried in the ground and those who are alive still on the earth, there's going to be a shout when Christ comes to rapture the church. There's going to be a loud shout, the voice of the archangel, and a trumpet blast of God. But there's a shout. Five in this scene are taken, and five are left behind. Now, here's the question. Why in the world would Jesus tell this story to symbolize, to illustrate the kingdom of heaven? Jesus tells everyone in this bridegroom context, keep watch. Why? Because no one knows the day and no one knows the hour of the rapture. No one knows when it's going to be. It'll happen suddenly. And here's his lesson in this. It'll happen suddenly and it will be too late to get ready then. Too late. Keep watch. Let's be honest tonight. Can you say you've been keeping watch? And what does that really mean? Can you say tonight with confidence that you have been keeping watch? That your life is about keeping watch? Why do you think Jesus specifically told us to pray this prayer at the end of Luke's account of the Olivet Discourse? And let me tell you what that is. The Olivet Discourse was Jesus' teaching about the end times to his very private group of disciples on a Wednesday before he's going to die on the cross on Friday. And in that, it's called the Olivet Discourse because he's on the Mount of Olives. He's got a group, a very small group around him. And he's telling about the end of time, about his coming, his next coming. And here's what Jesus says in that context. Luke 21, verse 34. Luke's account of the Olivet Discourse. Watch out. Jesus says, watch out. Don't let your hearts be dulled by carousing and drunkenness and by the worries of this life. Don't let that day. What day? Don't let that day. I believe he's talking about the rapture. Don't let that day catch you unaware like a trap. Now, I, as I read this, Luke's account of the Olivet Discourse of Jesus Christ, I want you to think about the five bridesmaids. Now, we'll read it again. Watch out. Don't let your hearts be dulled by carousing and drunkenness and by the worries of this life. Don't let that day catch you unaware like a trap. For that day will come upon everyone living on the, on the earth. It's a worldwide event. That day that he's referring to is a worldwide event. It's not localized. It's not isolated. It's not just going to happen in Jerusalem or Israel. It's a worldwide event. Verse 36, keep alert at all times. And pray. What? What would I pray? Pray that you would be strong enough to escape these coming horrors and stand before the Son of Man. What? Pray that you would be strong enough and ready enough to escape these coming horrors and stand before the Son of Man. Pray that you'd be strong enough to escape what? What's coming after this moment that you ought to be praying that you're not part of it? What is it? Now, I'm going to give you some advice, and I've shared this over the years with the church. I really believe that you should literally take Jesus' instruction personally. Every day that I pray, every day I pray this prayer. Lord, I pray that we would be strong enough to escape your coming ho these coming horrors and stand before the Son of Man. I pray, I pray that we'll be strong enough. That we won't be caught off guard. We'll be watching. We'll be waiting. We'll be ready. What are the coming horrors? Pray that you'd be strong enough to escape these coming horrors and stand before the Son of Man. What are the coming horrors? Let me give you the first of just two that I would want to describe. You will be left behind. 
Five of the bridesmaids were left behind. Five went through the door, and the door was locked. And what did he say when the door was locked and they're knocking on the door? What did he say? I don't know you. You want a horror? You want a horror beyond horror? When Jesus, the only hope we have of anything outside of death, the grave, and hell itself, is that we know him and he knows us. And he says, I don't know you. The door's locked. It's too late. But what's the second horror? There's another horror. As if that horror isn't bad enough, there's a second one. The tribulation is about to begin. I believe the coming horrors are the seven-year tribulation. Not just hell, as if I need something else to be horrible. Seven years of hell on the earth. Keeping watch means you are looking forward to the rapture with delight, not dread. Looking forward means you're keeping the oil supply in your lamp. You understand that no matter what it takes, you've got to keep the oil supply in your lamp until the loud shout happens in your life. Luke 21 and Matthew 24. Luke 21, Matthew 24 are both Jesus' Olivet Discourse. Just recorded by a different uh, person. One Matthew, one Luke. Matthew's account, listen, care, listen carefully. Matthew's account ends with, guess what? Matthew's account of Jesus' Olivet Discourse, where he talks about the end times, his return, his account ends with the parable of the ten bridesmaids. Luke's account ends with what? Pray that you would be strong enough to escape these coming horrors and stand before the Son of Man. So, what happens before the end of Matthew's account? So, listen, I want to read something. I, I've just told you how it ends, the parable of the ten virgins. What about before that? Like still, Jesus says all of that discourse. What's going to happen in the end? Verse 20, chapter 24, verse 42. So you too must keep watch. For you don't know what day your Lord is coming. Understand this, if a homeowner knew exactly when a burglar was coming, he would keep watch and not permit his house to be broken into. So you also must be ready all the time. For the Son of Man will come when least expected. A faithful, sensible servant is one to whom the master can give the responsibility of managing his other household servants and feeding them. If the master returns and finds that the servant has done a good job, there will be a reward. I tell you the truth, the master will put that servant in charge of all he owns. Now, that's Jesus's a description recorded by the gospel, in the Gospel of Matthew. And he begins with, you too must keep watch. And notice how the Apostle Paul describes this watching and this waiting in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6. As for me, by the way, this is the, the, one of the, la this is the last letter that Paul writes before he's executed for being a Christian. And he knows that his end is near, that they're going to soon uh, cut his head off because of his faith in Christ. And he writes this, As for me, my life has already been poured out as an offering to God. The time of my death is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. And notice this, because this is so important to me. I have remained faithful. You know when I read that? He's got a lamp full of oil. He's not distracted. He's not caught up in the things of the world. He's not even afraid. He's not afraid that he's going to die. My death is near. I've fought the fight. I've kept the faith. There's a race, and I've ran the whole race. I didn't stop in the race. I have remained faithful. Verse 8, and now the prize awaits me. The crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me when? On the day of his return. And the prize is not just for me. 
Not just for Paul. This is the encouraging part to me. I'm all happy that Paul's going to get a prize, that Paul has received a prize, the presence of God. The, be abs- Paul says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So when they cut Paul's head off and he became absent from the body, the soul of Apostle Paul was carried into the presence of God. He's got his reward. He's waiting a physical bodily resurrection of the last day. But his soul, and I believe in some intermediate body, is in the presence of the Lord and has been since his execution. And I'm happy that he's got this. But look, and the prize, not just for me. Paul says the prize isn't just for apostles. But who else is able to receive this prize And the prize is not just for me, but for all who eagerly look forward to his appearing. You know who those are? They've got oil in their limbs. They're not planning to go get some oil when things really get bad real quick. It's a bad idea. They've got oil in their lamps. They're eagerly looking forward to his appearing. There's a prize. Let's face it. There's only one legitimate reason. Let's be honest with each other. There's only one legitimate reason to fear the rapture of the church. That person has not made peace with God through faith in Christ. You're not ready. Down deep in your heart, you know you're not ready. So I want to read one more time. Luke 21, verse 34. Uh, Actually, I've memorized this, and um, I encourage you to memorize this. Watch out. Jesus says, watch out. Don't let your hearts be dulled by carousing and drunkenness and by the worries of this life. And don't let that day catch you unaware like a trap. For that day will come upon everyone living on the earth and pray. And then he says, pray that you'd be strong enough to escape these coming horrors and stand before the Son of Man. It's coming upon everyone upon the earth. Something's coming upon everyone on the earth. Paul's letter to Titus gives us something. I want to share this with you because there's one scripture. I think it's just three verses. It shows his first coming in Bethlehem. It shows how we ought to be living right now while we're waiting for the, the, the bridegroom to come and take his bride. And it shows the return of Christ in three verses. Titus 2, let's start with verse 11. For the grace of God has been revealed bringing salvation to all people. There's the first coming of Christ. The grace of God has been revealed, bringing salvation to all people. Jesus was born in Bethlehem. And we, verse 12, are instructed to turn from godless living, sinful pleasures. We should live in this evil world with wisdom, righteousness, and devotion to God. Now that just tells how people should live with oil in their lamps. And then look at the verse 13. While we look forward with hope to a wonderful day when the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ will be revealed. All three His first coming, how we're supposed to now wait with oil in our lamps for his next coming, are revealed in three verses. So back to the original question tonight. Is the rapture a a separate event to the second coming of Jesus when he will come to reign on this present earth. Is there some seven years? Is there going to be an event where the bridegroom is going to take his bride off of the planet earth and just they're gone? There will be people left behind. Is that a separate event totally to uh, Jesus coming and standing on the earth and beginning a reign on this present earth of a thousand years? Are they two events? Is there seven years in the middle of those two events? Are they separate events? I want to do something tonight, and I I hope you've got your Bibles out. I hope you get a copy of this outline so you can go through it with me. 
I want to compare the rapture event in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And I remember saying in one of those early sessions, I think it was the first one I did on the rapture, that if you believe in the Bible, you believe in a rapture. What you might be struggling with is whether or not anybody's left behind. But the Bible specifically says that a generation of people are going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. So if you believe the scripture, you believe in a rapture. But I want to tell you, I want to compare something. I want to take two scriptures. And these two scriptures are the only two scriptures in the New Testament that specifically refer to the return of Christ. Are you with me? Two scriptures. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, which is, I believe, the rapture event. And then Revelation chapter 19, I believe, is his second coming event where he will actually stand upon the earth and begin to reign on the earth. So let's do something. I want to read 1 Thessalonians 4, 15 through 17, the rapture event. I believe the next thing on God's prophetic timetable is what I'm about to read. We tell you this directly from the Lord. We who are still living, we who are still living when the Lord returns, will not meet him ahead of those who have died. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven. Jesus is going to come from heaven with a commanding shout with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God. And first, the Christians who have died will rise from their graves. Then together with them, we who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up. There's the rapture word. We'll be caught up, harpazo will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. There we shall be with the Lord. How long? Because you understand this. This is a final event. From that point, when these people get caught up in the presence of the Lord, it's not temporary, it's eternal. There we will be with the Lord forever. Now, I want to tell you, I believe this rapture event precedes the second coming of Jesus by some seven years. Not exactly seven years, some seven years. Now, let's do something. I want to read Revelation chapter 19, <clears throat> which I believe is the second coming of Jesus to the planet. Notice the first coming of Jesus I just read to you. It never says he touches the ground. We called up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. This one, he's coming to the earth. Revelation 19, beginning in verse 11. And then I saw heaven open, and a white horse was standing there. And I need to tell you something. A lot of people get confused in Revelation. If you go to Revelation chapter 6, there's a white horse there. This is not the white horse in Revelation 19. In Revelation 19, it's Jesus on a white horse. In Revelation 6, he's the Antichrist, or he's manifest, Satan manifest through the Antichrist. And there's a seven-sealed judgment, and a white horse comes out to make war. He's got a sword, and he's got a crown. Uh, he, he's coming to make war. It's, it's the, it is the tribulation. He's the first of the seven seals. And the reason I can tell you that's not Jesus is because Jesus is the one who's opening the seven seals. He's not one of the white horses. In fact, the white horse is illustrated as the Antichrist himself. But in Revelation 19, I saw heaven opened and a white horse was standing there. And his name, the rider, was named Faithful and True. This is Jesus. And he judges and he wages a righteous war. He's coming to the earth and he's judging and he's about to make a righteous war. His eyes are like flames of fire, and on his head were many crowns. A name was written on him that no one understood except himself. He wore a robe dipped in blood, and his title is the Word of God. Blood and the Word. The armies of heaven, listen carefully. When he comes on this white horse to wage a righteous war, his name is the Word, and he wears a robe dipped in blood. Who's with him? Who's with him? Verse 14, the armies of heaven. That's curious. Dressed in the finest of pure white linen, followed him and their own white horses. From his mouth came a sharp sword to strike down the nations. He's coming to do 
war against the nations. He's coming to planet earth to make war. He will rule them. That means he's got to be here to rule the nations, right? He's going to rule them with an iron rod. He will release the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty, like juice flowing from a wine press. On his robe at his thigh was written this title. He's king. He's the king of all kings, and he's the Lord of all lords when he arrives. So here's what I want you to do. If you could lay out 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 on this side and, and Revelation 19 on this side, I want to show you the differences. In 1 Thessalonians, Jesus appears in the heavens, in the clouds, in the air. But in Revelation <clears throat> chapter 19, he's coming to the earth. Totally different. In 1 Thessalonians, Jesus comes as a deliverer. But in Revelation, he's coming as a warrior. Totally different. In 1 Thessalonians, Jesus comes for the church. Who's he coming to get? He's coming for somebody. He's coming to receive somebody. The dead in Christ will rise first, and those of us who remain alive on the earth at that time will also rise to meet him in the air. He's coming for somebody. But in Revelation, Jesus is not coming for the church. He's coming with the church behind him. They've already been with him at a wedding ceremony. In 1 Thessalonians, Jesus comes with love and compassion. Do you see it? The dead in Christ, those who have been waiting the resurrection, their souls have been with the Lord. He comes with love and compassion to, to receive these resurrected bodies. But in Revelation, he's coming in wrath. In Revelation, he's coming in judgment. In 1 Thessalonians, Jesus comes as a bridegroom. I'm convinced that the rapture of the church is the literal fulfillment of the parable of the ten bridesmaids. <clears throat> he comes as a bridegroom, but in Revelation, he's coming as a reigning and conquering king. I want you to bear in mind that these two passages, this is really important, so hear me. These two passages that I've just talked to you about, 1 Thessalonians 4 and Revelation 19, are the only, are the only two detailed descriptions of Jesus's return in the New Testament. And they are totally different. Do they look like the same event to you? Are you still not convinced? Big question. So let's get into some detail. Who are the armies of heaven returning with Jesus in verse 14? They're on white horses. Who are they? Some of you might think, well, I've grown up always believing they were angels, and the angels are coming back with Jesus. So let's do something. I want to see who these people are. This is really telling. Who are these people with Jesus when he comes to make war against the nations? Who are they? They've obviously come, they've been in heaven with him before his return to reign on the earth as king of kings and lord of lords, they've already been with him. They're coming back with him. So let's go back up. Uh, let's, let's go backwards in Revelation 19, same chapter. Let's go up to verse 6 and 8 and see if we can identify the armies that are dressed in pure white linen, their own white horses. <laughs> And I'm trying to hold off on this, but I don't think I can. They're on white horses. And some of you are thinking, well, if that's the church, if that's the church that has been raptured and they're in heaven, the thought of having to fly on a white horse from heaven back to the earth terrifies me. Can I tell you, you're going to get a new body before that happens and your new body will be able to ride a white horse. So don't worry about it. Revelation 19, 14. One more time. Let me read it to you. The armies of heaven, dressed in the finest of pure white linen, followed him on white horses. Okay? Who are they? Who are they? So let's back up to verse 6, same chapter. And then I heard again what sounded like a shout of a vast crowd, or the roar of a mighty ocean waves, or the crash of loud thunder. Praise the Lord, for the Lord, 
our God, the Almighty, reigns. Now, don't, don't read over that part trying to get to the next part. What's everybody so excited about? What's all the, the noise about? The Lord is about to reign on the earth. On the earth. He's going to reign. Let us be glad, verse 7, and rejoice, and let us give honor to him, for the time has come for the wedding feast of the Lamb, and his bride has prepared herself. Wedding feast, bride, she's ready, she's prepared, she has been given. Well, how, do you know what the, how do you know the bride? She has been given the finest of pure white linen to wear. For the fine linen represents the good deeds of God's holy people. The army, this army in Revelation 19, that's coming back behind Jesus, dressed in pure white linen, is the church that had been taken from the world through this resurrection, through this rapture event some seven years earlier, is returning with Christ. Listen carefully. You see, his bride has been with him already during the seven-year tribulation. His bride is coming back with him in pure white linen to reign with him on this present earth with him as absolute authority and king. The bride escaped the tribulation. The bride was strong enough to escape the coming horrors and stand before the Son of Man at the wedding supper of the Lamb. Why? That brings up the next question. We've been in heaven. Why in the world do we want to come back down here? Because the Bible says whenever we are with him in the rapture, they will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, and there we shall be with him forevermore. Wherever he goes after that for eternity, we're with him. Never again will we be, will we be separated from him. So Jesus is coming back to the earth. Jesus is going to leave heaven. At the end of the tribulation, he's going to come make things right down here, and he's going to get what he deserves. He's going to be king of kings and lord of lords, and he's going to make war against those who have rejected him. And those who are with him, those who have participated in the wedding feast of the Lamb, will always be with him. So if he's coming here, we're coming here. The church age saints. Think about it. Why will the church return with Christ? We will reign with Jesus on this present earth for a thousand years. And I know there's a lot of people that say he's never coming back to the earth. Well, you're, you're going to struggle with the scriptures to say that because the scriptures very clearly says he is going to come back and he is going to stand on the Mount of Olives and he is going to take a seat on David's throne and he is going to reign for a thousand literal years on this present earth. That's what the Bible says is going to happen. The church age saints had already, listen, the church age saints that were with him in heaven in, in pure white linen, they've already received their resurrected and eternal bodies, and they are coming back with Jesus to fulfill two things. Notice, not only two things, but two I want to bring up. They're going to fulfill the Lord's prayer, and they're going to fulfill Gabriel's prophecy to the Virgin Mary. Many people pray their Lord's Prayer their whole life, and they don't even know what they're saying. What is the Lord's Prayer? In Luke 11, verse 2, this is how you should pray. Father, may your name be kept holy, and may your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Have you ever thought just through simply what that is? Lord, would you make things down here like they are up there? And the only way things down here are going to be like they are up there is if he up there comes to be king down here. Did you understand that when you pray the Lord's prayer, you're, you're praying for the day when Jesus will come down here and become king? What I just read in Revelation 19 is the fulfillment of that exact event. But there's one more. Gabriel made this announcement before the conception of Mary. Before she conceived the Son of God in her womb, 
Gabriel says this, Luke 1, 31, you will conceive and give birth to a son and you will name him Jesus and he will be very great and he'll be called the son of the most high. And here it comes. The Lord God is going to do something. He will give him the throne of his ancestor, David. I want to tell you something. That throne has never been in heaven. That throne is on the earth. And Gabriel made an announcement to Mary direct from God. This child that will be conceived in your womb is going to be a king who will reign on the earth from David's throne. That's Jerusalem. Verse 33. How long will his term last? Where specifically will he rule from? And he will reign over Israel forever. And his kingdom will never end. So what does the Bible say? Okay, okay, you got my attention. He's going to come and he's going to, we, we come back with him and we're going to reign with him on this present earth. But what about uh, Satan, who's called the dragon in Revelation? What about the Antichrist? He's called the beast in Revelation. What about this false prophet that advocates all of the, the darkness of Satan, the dragon, and the beast? What, what about th those characters? What, what about those while we're here? Revelation 19 and 20 kind of give us a clue. So I'm going to start with Revelation 20, verse 1. And then I saw an angel coming down from heaven with the key to the bottomless pit and a heavy chain in his hand. And he sees the dragon, the old serpent, who is the devil, Satan, and bound him in chains for how long? This is really important. We've just come back with Jesus. Jesus is now the king. King of kings, Lord of lords. He's coming to make war against those who have rejected him and his lordship and his king and his kingdom. So they have seized Satan. They've bound him in chains for a thousand years. Verse 3, the angel threw him into the bottomless pit, which he then shut and he locked so Satan could not deceive the nations the nations, there's people on the earth, the nations anymore until the thousand years are finished. And afterwards, he must be released for a little while. And then I saw thrones and the people sitting on them had been given the authority to judge. And I saw the souls of those who have been beheaded for their testimony. What? So he sees thrones on, on the earth and then he sees souls of those who had been beheaded for their testimony about Jesus and for preaching or proclaiming the word of God. Their souls. Now listen, he's looking at bodies right now. Not bodies. He's looking at souls. They don't have bodies. They're in heaven. I see souls. They are beheaded because they're preachers. They're preaching. They had not worshiped the beast. What do you think the context here? These are the people during the tribulation who came to Christ. And in this scene, Revelation 20, their souls are with the Lord. Their bodies, they've been beheaded. They had not worshipped the beast or his statue, nor accepted his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. They all came to life again, which means they all got dead in the tribulation. Because they refused to receive the mark of the beast, they were executed they all came to life again. And we're, we're not talking about the rapture here. No, 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 no. This is, this is after the rapture. These are the people who died during the tribulation. They all came to life again. And after they came to life again, at the same time they're coming to life again, we're all coming back with Jesus. The bride's coming in white linen back with Jesus. These, these souls are coming to life again. And they reigned with Christ for a thousand years alongside of us if we're in that rapture. This is the first resurrection. The rest of the dead, real important. What about the rest of the people? This is the first resurrection. The rest of the dead did not come back to life until the thousand years had ended. And I'm going to give you a hint. These, these that come back to life after the thousand years are ended are resurrected into the judgment in hell, what many call the white throne judgment. 
Blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. For them the second death holds no power. And they will be priests of God and of Christ and will, will, will reign with Christ for a thousand years. So who are those who are coming to life again in verse 4? Who are those in verse 4 that are coming to life? The souls, I saw the souls of those who had had died during the tribulation. They are now reigning with Christ for a thousand years. They are the ones who missed the rapture and came to faith in Christ during the great tribulation. Now, I know when I say that, I know when that comes out of my mouth, there are people, there are people who will say, well, you know what? That means that after the rapture, I can still come to Christ. That is the craziest idea I've ever heard in my life. It is true. It is true. I, I have to say it's true. Because I'm convinced that that's who these people are. And the Bible specifically says, and I think I touched on it in one of the earlier sessions, that the gospel will be preached throughout the whole earth before the end comes. Before the end of the end comes. So, I believe that during that time, the, the, there's going to be 144,000 Jews that are going to be raised up and supernaturally touched, and they're going to preach the, gospels to, the gospel to the Jewish people scattered around the world. And I believe that as the focus goes to preaching the gospel to the Jews, some Gentiles will come to Christ. But I also believe in my heart that those Gentiles coming to Christ are those who have not, were not raised around the gospel, that did not have the gospel and rejected the gospel before the rapture. In fact, I told you just, I think, last week that a spirit of delusion will operate during the tribulation. Satan's deception will be active during that where, where people, uh, even in the midst of the plagues and even in the midst of the horror of the tribulation, will still refuse to turn, repent, and turn to Christ. But some will. You know how? I know because he says that these people refuse to receive the mark of the beast. They were left behind at the rapture, but somehow uh, the Bibles were still here. Uh, these messages, I guess, will still be here, recorded on, on the internet or in books. The Bible will still be here. Some will come to Christ. So who are they joining in places of authority? Under the authority of King Jesus on this present earth in verse 4, they are joining these resurrected uh, tribulation saints. Let's call them tribulation saints. They came to Christ during the tribulation, and now they've come back to life again. Now they're going to reign for a thousand years. Who are they reigning with? They are joining raptured saints that had left with Jesus some seven years earlier. But there's one more wonderful and horrible comparison in Revelation chapter 19. The saints of God will experience the wedding supper of the Lamb. That's the wonderful side. The saints of God will experience the wedding supper of the Lamb, while those who have rejected Jesus as their king will become the feast as Jesus returns with wrath and judgment. One side will be at the feast with Jesus, while the other side becomes the feast and operates under the wrath of God, full strength wrath of God. I want to tell you what that looks like, because I know a lot of people struggle with this scene, but there will only be two sides. Revelation 19, 17, then I saw another, excuse me, I saw an angel standing in the sun shouting to the vultures. An angel shouting to the vultures flying high in the sky, come, gather together for the great banquet that God has prepared. Come and eat the flesh of kings. Come and eat the flesh of generals and strong warriors, of horses and their riders, and of all humanity, both free and slave, small and great. And then I saw the beast and the kings of the world and their armies gathered together to fight against the one sitting on the horse and fighting against the army that followed the one sitting on the horse. Now that's us. 
If we're in the rapture, we're coming back. And this beast is wanting to make war against Jesus and his army. Jesus and his bride. And the beast was captured. And with him, the false prophet who did many who did mighty miracles on behalf of the beast, miracles that deceived all who had accepted the mark of the beast and who worshipped his statue. And both the beast and his false prophet, both the beast and the false prophet, just a minute, just a second ago, they were wanting to make war. But now, both the beast and the false prophet were thrown alive. Notice the wording. Thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. Their story's over. Satan's going to be bound for a thousand years. After a thousand years, the Bible says he is turned loose for a season. And later, he'll be thrown into the lake of fiery sulfur. But these two, there's three of them. Some people call them the, the unholy trinity. They're the fake God and the fake son and the fake spirit. Well, the fake son, the Antichrist, and the fake spirit, the fake false prophet, or the false prophet that, that fakes the Holy Spirit, they're going to be thrown into hell, and they will not recover, and they'll never be known again. Verse 21, their entire army was killed by the sharp sword that came from the mouth of the one riding on the white horse. And the vultures all gorged themselves on the dead bodies do you see the options you can be raptured and enter eternity with the bridegroom or you can be left behind to experience the tribulation hell on the earth and even during the tribulation God offers one more opportunity for those who refuse the mark of the beast, but they'll be killed. They'll be executed. But what are the alternatives? You can join the wedding feast of God or you can become the feast of vultures. What a wonderful and horrible contrast. One final note tonight to those who have been taught that the God of the Old Testament was a God of judgment and wrath. And Jesus in the New Testament, he's the God of mercy and grace and love. And there is no judgment. Because I'm going to tell you, I know I meet a whole lot of people that that's what they, they don't study the scriptures. They let the world tell them about these two gods. One of wrath and one of mercy. <clears throat> one of judgment and one of grace and love. If that's you, then I'm going to ask you, please explain this statement of Jesus in the New Testament. This statement of Jesus in the New Testament is found in Luke 19, verse 24. Jesus says, then turning to the other standing nearby, the king ordered, take the money from this servant and give it to the one who has 10 pounds. But master, they said, he already has 10 pounds. Yes, the king replied, and to those who use well what they are given, even more will be given, but from those who do nothing. To those who do nothing. Let, let me tell you what I draw a parallel here. To those who do nothing, those are those, they absolutely have no oil in their lamps. But to those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. And as for these enemies of mine who didn't want me to be their king, this is Jesus talking. As for these enemies of mine who don't want me to be their king, he's going to be king. One way or the other, he's going to be king. As these enemies of mine who their entire life rejected me as king, as these enemies of mine who didn't want me to be their king, bring them in and execute them right here in front of me. You know what the truth is? More people are going to die under God's judgment in the return of Christ than all the Old Testament combined. Do you understand that? Let me tell you the truth. So to people who have been taught this lie, that the Old Testament God is different than the New Testament God, that we live in a different time, 
The only thing different about this time is right now, the grace of God has offered you and I this word of truth so that we might turn to him and receive this oil in our lamps and hold on to this treasure with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, and all of our strength. In Revelation 9, verse 14, I'll wrap up tonight. And the voice said to the sixth seal, before I read it, I want to say one more thing. More people are going to die in the judgment I'm about to read from future revelation than all the Old Testament combined. And, and I say that based on this scripture. And the voice said to the sixth angel who held the trumpet, release the four angels who were bound at the great Euphrates River. And then the four angels who had been prepared for this hour and day and month and year were turned loose to kill one-third of all the people on the earth. And you wonder why they call it the Great Tribulation? Do you wonder why Jesus in the Olivet Discourse says, if these days were not cut short, no human life would live on the planet? Now, some people have asked me um, on purpose, and some have asked me accidentally, why in the world would you do this series on the seven churches of Revelation and the rapture during a pandemic? And it makes me kind of smile because it's a good question. It really is a good question. Why in the world would you do this series, which is um, pretty much in your face, during a pandemic. I did not plan this series during a pandemic. I wrote this series way before there was a pandemic. I didn't plan it like this, but I'm convinced it is the message of God during the pandemic. It's the message of God during life itself. Do you understand why it's so important to keep watch? Do you understand why it's so important to be ready? Because I'm going to tell you tonight, to everyone who will hear my voice, the bridegroom is coming. I don't know the day and I don't know the hour, but the bridegroom is coming for his bride. And if you've got oil in your lamp, when he comes, you will leave with him. And you will escape the coming of horrors and you will stand before the Son of Man at the wedding supper of the Lamb. But if you think you've got time to react after that event begins, you are deceived. Next week, we're going to study the prophetic timing of the rapture, which will be interesting again during a pandemic. I want to pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your timing. For Lord, you know this was not my plan to do this at this season of the earth. I never knew when I wrote this and put it together in my schedule that there would be all this going on on the earth. But you did. So, Lord, I pray that you would put oil in our lamps. And that, Lord, we would be ready. We'd be waiting. We'd be eagerly anticipating our deliverer to come. And, Lord, the rapture will not bring us fear. The rapture will bring us hope. That, Lord, you have not destined us for wrath, but you have destined us for mercy. So, Lord, I pray for your church during this difficult time. May we shine bright in the midst of the darkness. And may we have the message of hope and never be ashamed of the name or the word. Prepare us for what's coming. I pray this upon your bride in Jesus' name. And amen.